Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smoko Podcast. My name is Alexis Armstrong, your host. The Smoko Podcast is the place to celebrate and highlight women, trans women, and non-binary folk working within STEM and trade occupations. So please tune in, take a break, join us. We are on Smoko. We are extremely lucky to be joined by the lovely Natasha Falcone, who is a specialist in biomaterials and drug delivery for the delivery of cancer immunotherapies, which is so freaking cool. So she is studying <laughs> cancer immunotherapies and 3D in vitro disease modeling, and this kind of designing novel immunotherapies and treatment for cancer research and cancer progression. She's a fellow at the mm-hmm. Terasaki Institute. And her two big projects right now are looking at liver and pancreatic cancer. Her background is in biological chemistry, molecular biology, and then a PhD at chemical engineering and applied chemistry. And it's just no biggie that her Tuesday is trying to solve cancer and trying to look at <laughs> solving cancer. It's an honor to have you on the show. I can't wait to learn more. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. If we could talk at the very beginning about How did you get interested in this, in biological chemistry and molecular biology? Mm -hmm. What drew you to this field? Did you always know that this was going to be the end goal to get to cancer research and get to this type of research? How did that happen? I know it sounds like a little cliche, but since I was like a child, I've always had an interest in science. My mom would give me these little experimental science books. We do like little, like a typical baking soda vinegar. I got like a microscope set for like my birthday I know it sounds very nerdy I literally always like love science and I'm like a very curious person I always want to know how things work I was always like interested in science classes I have more of that like math and science brain like growing up like in English like I I sucked at that (laughs) yeah I just liked uncovering different scientific mysteries oh my goodness <laughs> an explorer i love that answer i know that people be like oh it seems cliche i don't care i love how yeah, amazing like, that is being a little kid and just being so interested in it and being like yeah this is what i want to do and i want to discover this and kind of dive into science and understanding how things work how did the biological chemistry part come to play did you take a course in university that really you were like, okay, this is the direction or has it always been human and disease and that type of field, that type of study? Actually, in high school, I remember like towards the later years in high school, you have to start picking actual courses. So for sure, chemistry was, you know, like I'm taking chemistry. Like I've always yeah. loved, I literally go like forever like mixed bunch of things if you like create like <laughs> always on that so chemistry is for sure when I first chose I took physics mm. or I chose physics and then because I've always been really good at math not that like I love it but like I've always been just really good at it if there's like a straight answer like I could get it just like it's easy it makes sense to me but yeah. then I remember I had it like my second semester and a lot of people were talking about like the biology course and how it was so interesting and like fixing this gene and this gene and whatever Mm. literally I remember last night like it was like the day before the second semester starting I just something in me is like now I'm going to switch to fixing and biology and I did and that's when I had one of my like great teachers like he was so amazing and interested me so much and like all of everything biology I just was interested in high school and then in university i started taking like courses in science mainly like chemistry like mixing things creating yeah. things but <laughs> i always wanted it to be for some sort of like purpose i don't want to just do things just to do things and like how can this be applicable how can like i actually whatever i do help somebody one day i feel like that's where the biological application from what a full circle moment of getting that first chem yeah. set and just like mixing chemicals and being like no it's <laughs> For a young kid to be like, I know that this is like something that I love being like a little mini witch as like a kid. But for that to turn into, to be like, okay, how is this going to help us? I just think it's so amazing what you're doing. And it has such fantastic application. And it's going to impact so many people and help so many people. Thank you. I also remember seeing this quote once, you know, if you grow up and you be a scientist, it's like, you never really have to grow up kind of thing. I love that too, because I'm like, 
I don't want my work and like life separate. Like my work is part of me. It's what I love to do. I don't want to come to a place where I don't enjoy all the time. With science too, it's very different every day. It's not the same thing learning about this and this. It just changes because there's new discoveries every day as well. It intrigues me. No, because it is true. It's so novel. It's so dynamic. I think when you're following sciences or you're doing a career in sciences, it's not that career that work and life is separate. It's that like you yeah. brought your love of being super nerdy and really interested in one thing to your life, right? Like it is definitely a, a mesh yeah. thing. And so it's beautiful to have that drive and that passion for it. I wanted to talk about what you're doing right now at the Terasaki mm-hmm. Institute and your work. I know you study biomaterials and that's your specialty of 3D in vitro modeling and the delivery of drugs for immunotherapy. But before we get into that mm-hmm. research, because when I first wrote that down, I was like, I do not know what any of these words mean. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Could we maybe start there and being like, let's break it down for yeah. a layman like myself to be like, what is Definitely. a biomaterial? What is a 3D in vitro model? What are they used for? For sure. Biomaterials basically is a type of material that's either derived from biological substances or it's used for a biological purpose, okay. like a general definition. It's basically, material has some sort of biological application or okay. drives from magic. Like a protein or like a yeah. carbohydrate or like something like that. Okay. There's like lots of different types of biomaterials. There's hydrogels, which you could think of like hair gel or aloe vera gel, like that. It's that type of gel and it's basically material that's the main type of biomaterial that i work with are these hydrogels Um, those are the main types of biomaterials i use then there's also nanoparticles polymers ceramics metals everything um, depending on on yeah the application that you use with regards to in vitro models so these are essentially something that we're making in the lab that will mimic different tissues or environments. Like Uh I dealt with the pancreatic tumor model. So essentially I'm mimicking that pancreatic tumor microenvironment in the lab. And these are important because for different applications to be able to understand different biological mechanisms, like what are the different factors that play and contribute to cancer metastasis? understanding the biological mechanisms that go on within this environment, but also then to have a model where you could do different drug testing. So eventually you want to get patient-derived samples, and then you could do this in the lab. If a doctor is prescribing a patient chemotherapy, is it going to work for them? Do we want to just give it to them in their body and see what happens there? Can we have this model and see, does it kill their cancer cells? What is it affecting? And like, at least we'll know a little bit about whichever drug Mm -hmm. you're going to give to them prior to actually bring them the drug. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. It's basically like a proxy system. Yeah, essentially. Wow. My goodness. It's like basically creating like an artificial environment or an artificial proxy for what does a pancreatic cell look like or what does this look like in a liver? When you're doing your hydrogels, are they brand new or are they new types of hydrogels that have never been created to mimic that environment and to mimic it for the model? Or how does that work? So there's lots of different types of hydrogels okay. that we do here, like a lot. For the drug delivery aspect that I work on, those ones, I'm synthesizing newer materials that, you know, haven't been made before. Wow. And those... Actually, I want to make them kind of a new class of biomaterials, which are immunomaterials. And these are materials that have an effect on the immune system, which has a really wow. important effect when you want to deal with different immunotherapies. With regards to the modeling side, the ones that I've used in the lab are like gelatin based or hyaluronic acid based, and we'll modify them a little bit. With those, we're mimicking some of the components that are in the kind of extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is just like a matrix. It's an environment in which something develops in. So it's the surrounding medium, basically. Basically, this matrix, it gives support and structure to cells and tissues in the body. 
with regards to the in vitro modeling, we'll take a couple of components that are in the matrix of these tumors. So we picked hyaluronic acid and gelatin is a denatured form of collagen and collagen okay. the matrix. So basically, we're mimicking that environment to see, understand lots of different biological mechanisms. So it's not just like how the cancer cells grow, but how does the stiffness and the mechanical properties of the environment affect, have affect of those? Yeah. We could add immune components as well. And it's how does the immune and the cells and the biological environments all interact? It's very complex. And the more we're able to incorporate different aspects in vitro, we could get close to or closer to recapitulating what's going on in our body. Eventually, we would want to raise the need for in vivo studies, like using like mice and rats and sex, because one, there's a whole lot of ethical problems with that. And then the so mice actually like yeah, not represent like an alien, us. Like, really? <laughs> it's so cool that this type of modeling, you can control different aspects of a natural system. So you could put that on freeze yeah. and then you could do a different model to be like, okay, let's adjust the stiffness or let's change one aspect yes. a little bit, right? It's a stepwise system of that. And my next question yeah. is, could you describe this matrix environment? You did a wonderful job of describing the role oh, of the matrix God. and in cancer progression. When you're doing this matrix in this in vitro 3D modeling, where do you take your different tests from? Are they from known cancer patients or cancer cases? Or are they looking at what's common in the human body? Where are you getting those parameters from for your testing? The cancer cells that we use are cell lines that we order. I don't know if you're at ATCC, it's like common cell bank company, but we order the cells from there. Eventually, we're getting collaborators with clinicians that could provide us with patient-derived actual cancer samples. But right now, we're just using cancer cell lines. With regards to this matrix, just to like backtrack a little yeah. bit, the extracellular matrix, and this is how I got into it too with my biomaterial background, it really fine-tunes like a lot of the cellular processes, including cell proliferation and survival in cancer research, and it's specifically pancreatic, which like I was looking at, it really has an effect on biochemical and different biophysical properties it can activate certain pathways for cancer progression. In like pancreatic cancer, in comparison to a healthy state, it's so much stiffer, like the mechanical mm -hmm. properties are so much stronger. So basically with the gels that we chose, so we chose ones that mimic the components in the matrix, but also that we're able to fine tune these mechanical properties. So yes, we're going to make the gels much more stiffer. And then we looked at, okay, how, when it's higher stiffness, does it express more of these cancer progression markers? For example, a matrix, when you're designing a model for pancreatic, it's going to be different from the brain as well, because the brain is so much softer. And this is where that hydro biomaterials come in because we're able to choose different components and also tune their properties so we actually match the different like essentially like properties in our body basically yeah. the different cases the different organs and what you would expect with cancer progression of how that would change the body you're able to mimic it with different yes. materials i wanted to get back a little bit to this new novel biomaterial while we're still here right. your immuno material how would that be used how does that work is it an immunotherapy in itself, or is it modeling? That aspect of research I do, I'm really interested in it right now because I think it's a hot kind of topic. Basically, before in terms of research in biomaterials, you didn't want it to have an immune response. So okay. We're like, if it's immunogenic, we're like, no, that kind of thing. But Has now we're actually, yeah, like yeah. you want to use it for tissue regeneration and stuff, but you don't want to cause an inflammatory response, right? You want okay. to be, okay. And now there's this whole concept of immunomaterials where we're actually designing materials to harness the properties of the immune system or have an effect on them. I'm trying to deliver different cancer vaccines for the treatment of cancer. A vaccine in cancer term is basically you are delivering this molecule. It's like a protein that's overexpressed on cancer cells, but not so much in healthy cells. Okay. When you give it to your immune system, we're training the immune system. It's like, okay go find anything with this molecule on it and go kill it. The cancer cells overexpress it. Oh, so okay. sometimes cancer vaccines are not very immunogenic. 
these cancer vaccines have reached some clinical trials, but are not going past clinical trials. Mm. And that's because you're training it a little bit, but they're not causing like a huge immune response that's enough to actually kill the cancer. So we always wow. want to deliver these molecules with like say an adjuvant. It's just something that increases immune responses. But basically with the immunomaterial, it's like, okay, we want to design it in a way that it has the components that could increase, let's say, uh, immune cell uptake of the protein antigen so that it actually enhances the immune response. Wow. That is so interesting. Oh, you did? Use it as like a delivery. So like a delivery mechanism, the protein antigen where you have a sustained release, but also at the same time, it simultaneously acts as an adjuvant where in itself we're increasing like cellular uptake or antigen presentation to different immune cells. We're hoping to increase the efficacy of the actual vaccine. And basically giving it like a boost. If I was like putting it into a metaphor of like right now with cancer vaccines of being like, It's yelling at the immune system, but it might be yelling in a wrong language or it might be speaking really softly. And this is giving it a little boost to actually adequately say its message and broadcast it to the immune system to be like, hey, get your butt in gear and go get those cancer cells. If I was to break it down in like a very (laughs) (laughs) particular way. (laughs) No, but that's fantastic. That's so cool. That's been a change in this subfield that before it was like hey don't make it with any immune response and now it's like no we really need to focus on it if we could bring it to a a layman when we're doing your job when you're creating these biomaterials and when you're doing this modeling could you walk through how that actually works what are the steps that are involved in creating this model or creating this biomaterial and then of that maybe to get people in the right mind frame, what are the parameters that are going through your mind that you're like, I have to be conscious of these set list of things? The very first thing is literature review. Okay. So you read a lot of papers to see what's the gap, what's mm. the problem. So we always start with what's the problem right now. And then from there, it's okay. So now what's been done before and what worked and what didn't work. Are you designing new things? For example, when I'm designing my materials, I do set these peptide-based materials. I'll just give an example. Like when I'm designing like a peptide sequence, I'm going to be like, okay, I know these amino acids will self-assemble and form a hydrogel because there's so many reports on it. And I know these amino acids, they have been reported before as like aminogenic adjuvants, let's say. There's patents on it. From like my biological knowledge, I know like some fatty acids could increase cellular uptake through membranes and stuff. Knowing all of this information, I'm like, okay, now what if I combine this and this, like cool. will it form a gel, will it have like adjuvant properties and stuff? And then I'll go to the lab, I'll do it. And then you see if it works or not. Hmm. Like research is failure like 90% of the time. You right. have these ideas, yeah. but you can go try it. You don't know if it's going to work. But I think that's like the exciting thing too, because when it does work, it's like great. So that's my thought process is when I'm in designing these new materials, what am I going to use them for as well? Through my PhD, I made different hydrogels, I made different peptide compounds and stuff. And then when I moved to like my postdoc here, again, it was biomaterials, but I really opened up the applications of what you could do with these things and how many different things you could synthesize. And then I start kind of putting it together. Maybe cross-linkable materials are good when you want to find to the mechanical properties. Like physical biomaterials are good when you want to deliver things because they have these properties that allows them to be injected, whereas like these ones don't. So knowing their properties and knowing what's been done before. And then you just come up with, can I put all this together and does it work? Back to the basics of what like drew you to to chemistry. Yeah. Natasha, I love it because I don't think maybe people realize that science is basically failure constantly and you're like slowly yeah. just getting a little bit better and just being like, okay, what did I yeah. learn in that bad test did not work? Could you define that for people listening? What do you mean when it fails? What does that actually look like? And what does it mean when it's successful? How do you mm-hmm. all of a sudden measure to be like, oh my goodness, it's working? For regards to like, the amino material that I'm trying to design, let's say. I'm going to synthesize a bunch of things together and then I'm going to go test it with myself. 
So let's say I want the cells to express some certain protein to show that they're activated by the gel. So then it's like, I put the gel, I culture them with the cells, then I do another test and it's, okay, great. This expresses this protein I want. Perfect. I designed it. Yay. So exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to continue. It worked. But then it's like, I can spend so much time synthesizing this compound. Let's say it takes three weeks to synthesize, another couple of weeks to culture the cells. I finally put them together. I do all my staining. I go read it on the machine and it doesn't express what I wanted to. That would be like a failure. But when I say failure, I guess I have this personality. Yeah, a failure. Like research. <laughs> yeah. You can't get discouraged when you see this thing, when you see mm-hmm. these things. Like, yes, it sucks. <laughs> like you spend months go by yeah. and it didn't work after. It sucks. But then you have to take that and be like, okay. It didn't work. What can I do going forward? You always have mm-hmm. to be resilient. And honestly, sometimes failures are good too because you could publish it and be like, okay, well, I did this, 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 but this worked. It's for other people to read and see. And now they're not going to try mm-hmm. it and do the same mistakes that you're going to do. Has this been done before? Has this been tried before? And it's okay if it doesn't work. Not everything works. But as long as you take what you learn, what can I do going forward now? I think that's mm-hmm. what's most important. And that's what makes like good research is like not getting discouraged. Oh, totally. Because I think good research means that there's no such thing as failure. Like I remember when yeah. I was first doing my master's, I was so bummed when it like data didn't come out the way that I expected it and like the way that I had dreamed of and like I had created all these scenarios in my head of being like this is what the environment's going to look like and my advisor Mm -hmm. told me something that always stuck with me and being like no data is still data that's still a discovery in itself that it wasn't what we'd expect and like why isn't it like what we would expect why did that go wrong what happened to it that led to this that's just as important. And I think that's the best part about being a researcher is you have no idea what's going to happen. Natasha, is there anything while you've been doing all your testing, has there been anything from your data that's really shocked you that you just didn't expect? Has there been any big surprises? It always, not like that it surprised me, but I always get so excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, this actually work. Like what? It's surprising in like that way. So when we were doing the project with the in vitro modeling, we're hypothesizing that Yes, high gel biomaterial stiffness does in fact have an effect on the markers of cancer and stuff. When we found that it actually does, like we saw, we like when we did so much of this different data and we're like, oh my gosh, this gene and this gene and this gene are, are overexpressed when they're actually exposed to this more cool. stiff, like property yeah. of the biomaterial. I'm like, oh, that's actually really cool. I'm like, wow, because then it's like when you guess this information, Mm. it's out there now for, okay, if other scientists want to be like, okay, how do I target that? Targeting like cancer stuff, how do I enhance like the immune cell efficacy response? Now that we know that the environment really does play a role in these like cancer phenotype changes, can I make a treatment now to target that? And maybe that will increase the efficacy of some of these typical standard treatments that we have too. There's so many aspects of the treatment. You have a drug that directly has cytotoxic effects, or you have a drug that will increase immune cell efficacy and stuff like for treatment. Now it's like we're bringing in delivery mechanism. How can we target the environment or like certain pathways? I think that's pretty cool. That was like a fun project we wrapped up. Um, And then... If the immuno material gel that I'm working on now, if that works, that would be like really cool. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's absolutely amazing. I think you summed it up brilliantly of the fact that this is just like a step one. It could be like a marker. All of a sudden it's something new and then there's so many other researchers and there's so many other people that could then use this research as foundational mm-hmm. to treatment or to like a new drug or a new thing to target. And then even in one of like, another study so we had like our hydrogel system and we would incorporate like a chemotherapeutic agent in it and we were trying to do more kind of a local delivery because Mm -hmm. chemotherapy has lots of systemic side effects before i got here the institute did this kind of treatment on a melanoma type of cancer and it worked great and then i got here and i was put on this liver cancer project so we started off with kind of the same treatment 
And one of the things that was like shocking was that it didn't work as well on the liver and compared yeah. to the melanoma. This type of liver cancer is much more aggressive. And this conclusion that we made was gave us the idea to do the combination therapy where we combine chemo and immunotherapy together into a hard shell for the local delivery. So that was like another kind of like surprising result that I got. I'm like, wow. That was actually my next question is like, what's the progression of this of like, after you've successfully modeled an immunotherapy, what would be the future of the work? Do you move on to a different type of cancer, which sounds like sometimes you do? Or do you progress to a different type of testing or a different type of immunogel? What's the next step that you're like, okay, oh my goodness, my immunogel, it worked. It's amazing. I'm going to celebrate and like on a vacation for a week. And then what would you do next? Would you do immunogel too? Or would you do a different type of cancer? What would be the next step of that? I have the two kind of research, like the modeling and the joint mm-hmm. delivery. So with that, we modeled just the cancer environment. So we got the cancer cells, we put them in the hydrogel, and we looked at different like markers on the cancer. So a next step for that one would be to make an immunocompetent model. So co-culturing the cancer cells with the immune cells together. Oh, okay. And see how and it then in- interacts. Like, okay. Hydrogel effects on this, so, like immunocompetent models are becoming more popular because of the whole immune system and how their role in cancer really has an effect. And then in terms of the immunomaterial side, designing those, is it going to work for all of their peptides? Because this peptide antigen is expressed on only certain individuals. And there's so many other Mm. different protein antigen. You want to design the material that, okay, what kind of interactions do I want it to have with that protein? And it's not going to have the exact same effect for all of the ones for all of the body. Oh. That's where you come up with which material is going to work the best for this peptide for this cancer. So we're always like designing new materials depending on if we want to deliver a cancer vaccine or a cytokine or an antibody or a chemo drug. It's really going to have an effect on the application that we want to do. So right now I'm designing this one for a specific cancer vaccine for liver cancer. In the future, I will try different peptides. Maybe they might not release the same way because of different interactions with the gel and the protein. And then, yeah, ideally, you want to make it more applicable to other types of cancers as well. So it has a biomaterial background, and we're just doing applications in like liver and pancreatic. But to be able to do this biomaterial and give it to other types of cancer patients, that's something that we're interested in as well. It's so interesting, and it's so cool that it could be used for so many different types of cancers and be used in different types of applications. Mm-hmm. What I understood of yeah. is like yeah. create the model specific to what you're actually looking at and then taking that as an end goal, being a good scientist and working your way up to be like, yeah. okay, what's working? Yeah. What isn't working? What do I need to change yeah. in relation to that? This might be a little bit of a different type of question or a step back maybe of when we're mm-hmm. talking about cancer testing and cancer treatment as a whole in an industry. There's so much interest in it. The public obviously wants to cure cancer, and that's been something that's been a huge goal forever. Do you think that there's anything that the public doesn't really understand about this space or any kind of misconceptions that they think maybe the public needs more education? Or where would we start as a layman to better understand what you do and the future of your industry, of where your industry is going? We all say we want to have the cure for cancer. That's been like, said a bunch of times, but I think the treatment, the more that I get into it, I realize the treatment is actually very difficult. First off, there's a million different types of cancers that don't function the same way. And, oh, and two, yeah. the actual patient mm-hmm. and their like environment really has an effect on treatment outcomes as well. A misconception of I want to cure cancer is there's not going to be a cure, like one cure for all like cancer. Every cancer for every yeah. patient. That's something that you really have to take into consideration. And that's why I feel like there's so much research on it. And there's going to be continued, there'll continue to be so much research because it really depends also on like patient specific mutations. Your genetic code is different from mine. They express different mutations than you. Sure, this one drug is not going to, it can, but it's not 100% guaranteed that it's going to work mm-hmm. for me the same way it works for you recently how the whole microbiota is 
having effect on how your body responds to treatment. Now people are taking that into consideration too. In your tumor microenvironment, it has its own kind of microbiome, like how our gut has microbiome. And people have found like that has an effect on different immunotherapy wow. treatments too. Yeah. And, like there's so many things that are coming out. There's so many things that we're finding out that has an effect on not only the cancer progression, but how your body's going to respond to the treatment. People have been talking about like resistance to bacteria forever. forever and that's now. why you keep yeah. needing to get research in this area. Like you need new antibiotics all the time because we're evolving, but bacteria is evolving too. And like cancer is evolving. So I think like different treatment aspects will work for different people and yeah. different types of cancers. We need nothing but research and we need everyone looking at it and it needs to continue. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good call out too, because I do think that we have this like homogenous view of cancer and cancer treatment and cancer research that we view that it's one thing and that it's going to be one treatment. It's going to be this mythical, mm. magical treatment that's going to stay yeah. an attic forever. And then once we get that, yeah. it's going to be like penicillin or it's going to be something that yeah. stays constant like with time. Saying, I like no, that exactly. call out of being like, it's so complicated. But I also think the theme of this is like how science is constantly evolving and changing. But then it's also the bacteria yeah. is changing and cancer is also evolving. It's a natural thing. It's not something nope. static. It in itself is changing too. So how do we mm -hmm. keep up with that? And there's always going to be that lag and there's always going to be that jump of understanding as we figure out this puzzle piece. I honestly didn't realize that until I started getting into like the research as well. People will always talk about like, yeah, there's going to be a cure one day. I'm like, well, I hope there's like a 50 million different cures because that's what we need, honestly. We don't need one. We need like we don't a need billion. One. Yeah. Yeah. And on that, Natasha, is there anything right now that like you're really excited about? Is there something specific that you are obsessed with that you're nerding out about? Is there something that kind of gives you hope for this big holistic curing cancer that's bigger than all of us? I kind of discussed like the new meds are really interesting like that's my focus right not well it's becoming more of a novel type of treatment using these immunotherapies as opposed to radiation and chemotherapy and they really want to work if I could like get the material to work as a delivery system and simultaneously like as an adjuvant that's what I'm yeah and then they, like was just saying about how this microbiota in your body kind of is. um that would be what I would want research into and because you know, there's just recently these articles that said like, no, your gut microbiome, like the tumor actually has its own microbiome that has an effect on these therapies. And I was like, what? People know this. Like, can we target it somehow? Is there anything that like in the literature, in the community that gives you hope? Has there been big strides, but you're like, oh my goodness, they figured it out on looking at like lung cancer or they figured it out with a different type of disease is there anything in the community that you're like oh my goodness one day we're going to get there for pancreatic cancer really i mean like i keep up to date it's kind of uh, i see you know but um you know there's just all over the world that are that are looking into those type of things and approaching it in aspects which that's what I, like i mentioned about shams but i have biomaterial background so i'm approaching it from you have like and the, and the immunologists will do from the you know immunology point of view and then you have your, your chemist and like i think what's getting really really cool is that okay, so we're you know before maybe people would only read paper in their field like if i'm trying to make this i'm going to just read chem now it's like you know i'm getting because you know, they may have solved it from this aspect, but if I combine my expertise, then, you know, we can move forward, like sidetrack, but like, that's also something that the Terra Institute really does want to like be kind of proud of is that we're people from, you know, so many different backgrounds. Like we have biology clinicians, uh, chemists, engineers, and like, it's a bit disciplinary here. So we'll to like tackle these problems from so many faster. You know, and where you can really like achieve what you want to do faster and like really have an impact. I think that's probably where the best type of science is going to come from is like more people looking at it, more people looking at it with a different point of view and coming to a common decision of it. It feels all of a sudden this big kind of 
gigantic problem, it feels like a little bit easier to manage if there's so many people looking at it, is broken down. That might be the answer for the next one is what do you love most about working within this field? Maybe it's that, the cross-disciplinary, or maybe it's discovery. What do you love most about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, all of the... I mean, I love research in general. Like, I want to be like a curious person. Like, I want to do the great to solve big problems. Like, have all of it. The whole thing. That's honestly what you want. You want someone to be like, yeah, I love every single aspect. I can't choose one, man. I can't wait to see what happens with this new therapy. It's so cool to hear what you do and how passionate you are for it and the impact that this type of research has on the public and has the potential to have huge impact in terms of people's health and protecting them. And with that, if anyone is listening and they're like, oh my goodness, this girl is a complete freaking badass and I want to become her and this is what I want to do. Any advice for them if they're just starting out and they're like, okay, I want to go into STEM. I want to follow her path. I would say like be persistent and like continually fight for what you're passionate about so with this like i'm very passionate about it like i love what i do and like sometimes i wake up and i'm like wow i'm gonna go to the lab and do and like that's my job you know like as you have that like sort of attitude that it just it makes things so much more fun but also you achieve things like better as much like like i said like research though you know at the beginning of course i was the same where i was like I got a result, didn't work out. I'm like, man, whatever. And so that's where like, you know, persistence comes in. You know, I think that if you really want something also, like no matter what barriers are there, like don't let someone tell you. Because, you know, I knew that I loved research, but like my undergrad, like did I have the best grades and stuff? Not really. Did I know that I was going to get into grad school? No, I had the mentality of this is what I want to do. So like no one could tell me to do it. So it's like, if they don't accept me, I'm just going to try again. I'm just going to do something. And I'm going to, so it's like, if you really like, also from like a woman perspective as well, like I've known like a lot of situations, you know, like I see like women have to work a bit harder and like they, they need to prove themselves, seen it, you know, around me. It's not just something that is like, oh yeah, no, seriously. I'm like. The higher you move up the science too, the women there are. Like, put that out there too. Like, do it. You know, like, we need it. Perspective too. Like, like, you know, in some of these meetings where they're more, and I'm like, there could be like more women here that will like really benefit and like help this meeting go run so much smoother. Like, it's just like different athlete and it's in terms of whether it like comfortable thing or you know family thing or, or i don't know so many different reasons why like they don't keep going but i feel like now we're in like a day where we have options and like i feel like if you're interested like don't get discouraged because like i've seen women around me that get comments you know these kind of comments that discourages them but i feel like we need to like continue fighting and like do it because like we belong in this industry it doesn't matter yeah exactly we need to stay here and then and yes we do we belong in this industry and this industry was made for us any help if you've gotten those comments and you've gotten discouraged because I do think a knee jerk when I used to get those comments and still honestly if they catch me on the wrong day and someone tells me a comment it will affect me some days I'll just be able to get over it and some days I won't some days it'll hit a little bit closer to home do you have any advice for maybe when it does hit closer to home or like when you're like oh my god today is just not my day or I'm really new to the idea of research and this idea of failure. Anything that's helped you get through that and change your mindset? Um, 
Yeah, and I would say it's like talk to people also. You don't have to like keep it to yourself all the time. A lot of scenarios where like some girls, like they kept certain things that happened to themselves and like it like weighs on them more. But, um, you know, a decent like amount where like, you know, it could have happened some else. And like you telling someone like really help you like need and like get through the me like I've I've like developed thick skin so like if you know things were kind of discouraging I would like doubt myself like can I do this I was to be here but now I'm like if someone says something too bad like you know like you're any rave and I was like if you want to treat me this way fine but I will like prove to you that I, you know like you're gonna buy these of course and like I've been through some like experiences too where I'm like yeah but then like sleep on it I'll like talk to somebody about it or then I'll wake up the next morning and I'll be like, you know what? I'm not going to let whoever around me impact because at the end of the day, this is my life. This is my career. What helped me is now as I've gotten older and more comfortable to be like, I deserve to be here. What's helped me is just letting them. I don't really care if they view me as lesser anymore. If you view that I don't know, that's fine. That's on you. But you're going to find out very soon that I do have that expertise. And then you're going to have to come to that realization once you get on board or you finally realize your bias i think that's helped of just letting people maybe underestimate you and just be like okay well they'll figure it out it'll be a shock to their system when they figure it out but they'll figure it out it's not my job to try to bring them on board and to show them my validity like it takes too much energy if you want to discredit me go for it but i'm just going to be over here doing my job and eventually you're going to catch on and look like an idiot so that's helped but it's took time i don't know i don't know about you yeah no, I love that. I love that. You like hit it, like hit it all. Like that was perfect. Seriously, it's not like our job to like make the people around me like, yeah, you know, like I'm gonna have to prove to you. It's like whatever I'm proving, like I'm proving for myself to it. You know, it's like I used to want to be like, yeah, like I could be like leaving me and stuff. It's like I myself, the person who's like giving me that believes in me. Like, I don't care about the other people. If you want to, like, waste your energy talking about why I shouldn't be here, I should not. Go ahead. Have fun. I'm over here looking at my cool gels, and I'm excited about my immunotherapy, and I just want to do my job, man. Read about me in nature when it comes out in a week. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, Asia, thank you so much. This has been so cool. It's so fascinating and it's amazing research. Just thank you so much for coming on and educating us and doing an amazing job to explain it to a layman. Thank you so much for having me, honestly. Really thank you again for coming on the show. And thank you everybody for listening. This is the Smoko Podcast. We have new episodes every Wednesday. So we will see you next week. So ta-ta for now. <laughs>